time uh, we began by, by looking at the, uh, the Habsburgs. And the Habsburgs were a powerful family, a dynasty, that uh, in the 16th century, with Charles V, were probably one of the most powerful peoples on the planet. And uh, part of the great wealth and power of the Habsburgs came from there, from Spain. You know, one of the developments we see in the early modern period uh -huh. is the, the emergence of nation states. And we see that uh, Spain, uh, the nation state of Spain, which was just recently formed through the marriage of Ferdinand and Isabella, Spain was uh, the dominant power and a great nation state in the 16th century. And uh, today we're going to talk about two of the, uh, the great kings of Spain, father and son, Charles V, who we, we already <coughs> began to speak about, and his son, Philip II. And they kind of set the tone for Europe uh, and European international diplomacy in the 16th century because Spain, on account of its great empire in the New World, was such a wealthy and powerful state. Now, um, what we see happening, though, is that uh, we see with Philip II uh, the emergence of what we call absolutism. Now, there's a reading you should read about, about absolutism in your, uh, in your uh, book. I mean, the additional readings I put on, on the news. But, uh, but Philip II kind of was a uh, kind of a uh, early pioneer in uh, establishing a strong and powerful state. And now, ironically, it would not be Spain, but it would be France in the 17th century that would build on that idea of absolutism. And it would be France that would replace Spain as the dominant, at least the dominant continental power uh, in Europe in the, in the next century, in the 17th century, which we'll hopefully get to today. But, but what we're going to focus on after we finish up Spain is how, in the 17th century, absolutism was not the only system of government that was available. And there emerged an alternative system of government in England, now it, it, what we call constitutional monarchy. Now, in England, uh, England had developed this alternative system where the idea is that you still have rule by a king or a queen, a monarch, but the king or the monarch is subject to the same laws as everybody else. In other words, that you have a system of laws that puts limits on the power and authority of government. And the reason why we spend any time on England, of course, in relevance to us today in the 21st century is because the American system of government to a large degree, goes back to this system of government that developed in England in the 17th century, or by the end of it. It, was, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It was a long and difficult process that involved wars and, and a lot of violence, uh, but it took a while. But eventually, England would emerge with this constitutional system, and that system would be, in many ways, the basis of the American political tradition. Except we don't have a king, we have a president or a governor. So, uh, so this is uh, something that uh, we need to study and focus on. That's why we, we look at the history of England in, in a large degree. But it's important to remember that uh, the idea of, uh, of, of individual liberty, the idea of the government by laws rather than by men, you know, uh, the idea of having a written system of laws that sets limits on the power and authority of government, the idea of a, of a written law that establishes rights for individuals that, that all citizens possess, or, or in this case, subjects. These, are, these were principles that were not, uh, came upon easily. It was only through war and violence and bloodshed and strife that these principles developed over time. So uh, when you, when you, you should always be thankful that you had ancestors, if, well, if you're of English ancestry, you people 300 years ago had to undergo a lot of hard times to, so that we can enjoy the freedoms that we, we have today. All right, so that's what we're going to hopefully get to today. But before we get to England, we need to go back and look at Spain in the 16th century. Now, we talked about Charles V and how he inherited a huge empire by the time he was just a young lad, 19 years of old, and he controlled half of Europe almost. But uh, he was, uh, turned out to be quite an active monarch, and uh, he had certain ideas that he wanted to do. Uh, he wanted to expand the House of Habsburg. He wanted to strengthen the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, he wanted to defend the church. 
And uh, if you look at his, uh, his goals and his aspirations, um, his only, his really great success came with number one. He really did expand the glory and power of the Habsburg Empire. Uh, it was during his reign that Spain acquired its huge empire in the New World. But in the other two uh, objectives, he didn't enjoy nearly as much success. In fact, he, he suffered a lot of setbacks. So we're going to talk about Charles V. And we're going to talk about his son, Philip II. Now, um, one of the reasons why Charles V enjoyed his success was because of the rise of the Spanish Empire. Now, I'm not going to go into detail because we've got to get going here. But remember, do that reading on, on the, the Age of Exploration. But uh, one of the things that happened was that the conquistadors, who we already discussed, uh, these Spanish warriors uh, conquered these vast empires in the New World. And uh, in, in Cortez's case, he conquered the Aztec Empire in, uh, here, in, uh, <coughs> here in Mexico. Um, in the case of uh, Pizarro, he conquered the mighty, uh, the mighty Inca Empire in what is today Peru and eastern or western South America. And this, this resulted in these two vast empires falling under Spanish control. Now, these empires were very wealthy, and they had lots of gold and silver, and all that wealth flowed to Spain. Um, now, a couple things to remember is that uh, one reason why the Spanish had great success in pacifying and conquering these empires was because of the impact of, of these diseases. You know, part of the Columbian Exchange means the introduction of diseases to from the old world to the new world. And uh, smallpox especially, but also cholera, these diseases uh, were very deadly to the indigenous populations of the new world. And so that really made it a lot easier for the Spanish to come in and conquer these areas because of the fact that so many of the population were, were dying of, of disease. Now, the, the, the uh, Spanish set up a system to fully exploit this region. You know, when one of the first things that Charles V did was to establish a system where uh, the <coughs> governors appointed by him only answered to the king. So it was a very uh, top-down kind of system. There wasn't much or any or very little uh, autonomy for the, the provinces. They were under direct <coughs> control of the Spanish crown. Now, uh, for example, the governors were appointed by the crown. Uh, the officials were appointed by the crown. Uh, there wasn't uh, any kind of uh, elections or uh, local control to any large degree. Um, they did allow certain towns to have like a city council. Uh, that new towns that were established were allowed to have city councils, but that was the extent of local government. Um, now they also set up a system where um, the, the locals were fully exploited. Um, it was called the encomienda. Um, the way it worked would be that uh, basically the, the Spanish settlers, the Spanish conquistadors, were rewarded for their services to the crown by be being given huge amounts of land and the native labor that went with that land. So, so with the encomienda, a, uh, a Spanish overlord would basically have the ability to enslave the local inhabitants and force them to work in the field as his slaves for as long as he wanted. Now, the encomienda was, the, was prefaced on the condition that these landlords, the owner of the encomienda, would allow for the church to come in and uh, convert the natives to Christianity. Um, but it was a system that off, off obviously created lots of areas for exploitation. So you had some encomienda people who had no problem just being very harsh and brutal with their, the indigenous population, forcing them to work day in and day out as slaves on their own land. Um, now, eventually, um, as more and more natives converted to Christianity, um, a, a later king, Philip II, uh, when he was king in the late 16th century, he, he abolished the encomienda system because of all the accounts he was hearing of the brutal treatment. Once the natives had become Christians, in his view, they, 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 they should not be slaves. So he basically took steps to end the encomienda system. But you still have, by the time the encomienda system was uh, dissolved, by the end of the 16th century, you already had a social system in place where the native 
Europe, the native populations were uh, second-class citizens compared to the European uh, colonists who had come in and were the landlords and the control of the land, while most of these, they were no longer <coughs> slaves after the encomienda system was abolished, but they were essentially worked as tenant farmers uh, on, or agricultural laborers on the lands of these uh, European settlers. Um, another practice that the Spanish did was the, called the repartimiento. I can't speak Spanish, so excuse me. But uh, what, what this was, was a system where the native populations were expected to provide slave labor to work in the mines. And so uh, thousands upon thousands of people from what is today Peru and Mexico were, were basically drafted and put to work in the mines um, for gold, mainly gold and silver. Uh, and so they had all this access to this, this forced labor. <coughs> now one reason why the Spanish were able to impose these very harsh systems on the native populations, well one factor was so much of the native population died of disease, but another factor was that both the Aztec and the Inca empires that were there before the Spanish even got there employed the exact same system. So when the Spanish came in, it was like new owner, same policy. So, I mean, the Aztecs and the Inca exploited local peoples, used forced labor, and so when the Spanish came in, they already had a system in place where the local populations kind of expected to be treated like slaves and be forced to work and do this labor uh, because it was expected of them. So uh, the Spanish really hit the jackpot in getting a population that would go along with this kind of treatment because it, it, was a, it was a cultural system already in place. Now, with the Spanish, you had a system where the Spanish elite, the Euro people who had come over from Spain uh, and other Europeans who came to the New World, to Latin America, they were the ones who were the elites. They were the new elites. Uh, and, uh, and the native population were the, considered to be the, the laboring classes. They were the lower classes. Now, there slowly emerged over time in much of Latin America a, a mixed population. So they're, they're, all, they're, they're developed over time, uh, the offspring of Europeans and, and natives. And over time, this, in, places, in places like Mexico, this population became, over the course of, of centuries, the, the dominant population in the country. Now that was not true throughout Latin America. Mexico has a very much a mixed population, but if you go to places, a place like Peru uh, in, in, Latin, in South America, the, the native population uh, still keeps itself aloof and is distinct from those of European ancestry. So in some parts of, of Latin America, you had a, a sharp distinction between natives and, and Europeans, but in other areas, there developed a very large population of, of people of mixed blood who spoke, who, who came to speak the Spanish language and, and were of European and native ancestry. Um, now, real quickly, uh, in much of Latin America, uh, especially in the Caribbean islands, uh, the, the, the devastation of these diseases was so great that there wasn't any natives left to work. So, and this was true in places like Brazil, Venezuela, uh, in addition to the Caribbean islands like, um, like what is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic, Hispaniola, or Cuba. Uh, these native populations were just basically wiped out by disease, and so um, you had all these European uh, owners of estates who didn't have any laborers. So to, uh, to fill in that gap, that's why the, the transatlantic slave trade became so important. Um, and so uh, by the end of the 16th century, and especially into the 17th century, thousands upon thousands upon thousands, it's like close to a half a million people were uh, transported from Africa to the uh, mainly to the New World, to, and uh, now some of them made their way to the American colonies, but the vast majority of them went to, to Brazil and to the Caribbean islands to work. Now as sugar, uh, as sugar became a, a major agricultural staple in, in especially the Caribbean islands, uh, sugar production really required intense labor. And so, so the growth of sugar in the, in, the, in the sugar trade and the growth of sugar production in the Caribbean especially fueled fueled the transatlantic slave trade because you needed more and more slaves to brought over from Africa to work in these uh, work on these estates. 
And, uh, um, but you, you know, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, I want you to make sure you read all the readings on, on, that, on that topic. Um, now, just to give you an, an example of the impact on Africa of these developments, um, it's important to remember that uh, in, 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 in the case of Africa, uh, most of the work of acquiring slaves was actually done by Africans. The Europeans just kind of came in, set up their outposts along the coast. Most of the, most slaves came from what is today West Africa, especially the Horn of Africa. But usually the work of actually acquiring slaves was done by native African kingdoms. And then the Europeans would set up maybe an, uh, an outpost along the coast, and then the, the slave traders would bring the slaves to the, to the coast and then the uh, and then the, 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 they would be brought over to uh, to the New World. And uh, you see, in Africa, uh, slavery had been practiced uh, uh, for thousands of years. And uh, in, in fact, uh, it was not uncommon in many West African societies for if, if you were in debt, if you, if you were in debt and you owed money to sell your, your your children or yourself into slavery as a way of covering your debts. Another another source of slaves were, were wars. Um, and whenever there was a war, uh, the, those who were defeated and captured would be sold as slaves. So there was a very active slave trade in Africa before even Europeans arrived. So when the Europeans arrived in the sh shores of Africa in the 16th century, there already was a slave trade in place, but the, Euro the Europeans just really focused in on that and expanded on that trade because there was such a demand for labor over in the New World, in, in, the, in the colonies especially the Caribbean. But uh, this, you can see this in play, and I want to just give you a specific example. Uh, there's a man, uh, a ruler in a, in a West African state called Congo. Congo, the state of Congo was a, uh, was a, uh, a, a kingdom located in what is today southern West Africa, and uh, uh, roughly equivalent to what would today be the, the country of Angola. But uh, Al Alphonse, that wasn't his, his birth name. He, uh, initially when Europeans arrived, they were interested in gold and ivory. So first when Europeans arrived, they just wanted to trade. And in fact, some, some, some Christian missionaries arrived and they were able to convert the king to Christianity. So Alphonse, he, that was his baptismal name. He, 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 that was his new Christian name. And he at first welcomed this, the, the Spanish and Portuguese, mainly the Portuguese, and was happy to see him and uh, encouraged them in their acts of uh, evangelism to, to bring the, his country into Christianity. But during his lifetime, all of a sudden the Portuguese, they wanted slaves. And so he found a, he found a situation where um, these, uh, these Portuguese traders were actually working with, with rough elements to kidnap his people, to sell them as slaves. So when he tried to put a stop to it, uh, by this time the Portuguese were only thinking about the slave labor opportunity. Uh, what they wanted from slave labor. The Portuguese um, encouraged his, his rivals, his neighboring states who were his enemies, to attack him, and eventually the kingdom of Congo was destroyed by its neighbors. And the Portuguese encouraged this destruction because they wanted this kingdom out so they could mainly, mainly use it to take it over and, and use it as a, uh, as a place to, to draft, draft slave labor. And by the end of the 16th century, what had been the Kingdom of Congo was now a colony of Portugal, the, the colony of Angola. And the Portuguese would control Angola until 1976. But, but in, the, in the heyday of the 16th to 17th century, Angola was a major source of slaves. There's probably large numbers of people uh, in America today, in the United States, who probably can trace their ancestry, if they could do it, back to somebody who lived in what is today Angola. Uh, a lot of them, what is today Nigeria. But anyway, so I just wanted to give you a specific example of how the slave trade would have an impact on, uh, on Africa. But, it, but, but, but thousands upon thousands of Africans were brought over to the New World. And uh, in places like the Caribbean, <coughs> like in Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and to a lesser extent Cuba, uh, the African population is a very large percentage. I mean, it's almost 100% in Haiti. Uh, in terms of the going back to the to the slave trade. All right, now um, now getting back to Charles V. So he, he he acquired a huge empire and all this gold and silver from the New World, and that was giving him a lot of success. Now um, now one of his 
jo jobs he saw himself doing is he had to defend the church. And so he found himself locked in a, in a constant war with the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire was a Muslim empire. Uh, the Sultan <coughs> was considered himself to be the caliph, the, the spiritual leader of all Muslims in the world. And uh, one, of the, one of the most important duties of a Muslim caliph, a Muslim ruler, was to expand the faith, to, to, bring, people, to bring people under the rule of, of Sharia law, the law of Islam. And so the Ottoman Empire was based in what is today Turkey, and in the Near East was an empire bent on expansion. And, it, and we'll talk about the Ottoman Empire a little later in the class. But, but um, what, what happened was that during the reign of Charles V, he found himself constantly under attack on diff in different theaters from Ottoman forces. So he had to devote a lot of time fighting these wars. For example, Vienna, uh, in what is today Austria, um, after the Ottoman Empire occupied uh, Hungary, after the Battle of Mohawks in 1526, they turned their attention even further west. They wanted to invade all of Europe. You know, they brought huge armies against Vienna uh, on the Danube River. Vienna kind of is the main entry point into Central Europe. So defending Vienna was key to protecting Central Europe, the heart of Europe, from an Ottoman Empire invasion. And Vienna was, in fact, besieged twice by massive Ottoman Empire armies in 1529 and again in 1532. Um, also, uh, in addition to that, um, not only was the Ottoman Empire a threat to Central Europe, but by the time you get to the reign of Charles V, the Ottoman Empire had expanded all along the coast of North Africa. So you had uh, an Ottoman Empire extending all the way to what is today uh, Tunisia and Algeria. And um, in fact, the, Muslim imp the, Mo the Ottoman Empire was, was building fleets, and uh, a huge Muslim fleet was threatening Spain, Italy, and southern France. So the, the, the Ottoman fleet in the early 16th century was the dominant naval power in the whole, whole entire Mediterranean. Now, um, in fact, uh, the, the, the Ottoman Empire had one of its greatest generals who commanded the Mediterranean fleet. His name was Barbarossa Hayreddin Pasha. Now, here's a, here's a picture of him, looking rather brave. Uh, he, he was actually uh, Greek. His, his father was actually a Greek Orthodox priest. The thing about the Ottoman Empire was that if you fought for the Sultan and converted to Islam, they loved you. You know, anybody could fight for the Sultan. In fact, uh, the, the fleet of Barbarossa Pasha included large numbers of Europeans, uh, Dutchmen, Irishmen, Germans, Danes, who had converted to Islam and joined the fleet to fight the jihad, to, to wage war on the Christians and to dominate the Mediterranean. So, so basically, Charles V was in a constant war with his fleet. Uh, and uh, his situation was made more uh, dangerous by the fact that Spain included large numbers of people who had Muslim sympathies. You see, uh, they were called the, the Moriscos. You see, uh, when, when the the Muslims were kicked out of Spain in 1492. Large numbers of Muslims at least ostensibly converted to Christianity so they didn't have to leave their homes. And they were known as the Moriscos. From the Moors were the, the Muslims from North Africa who had lived in Spain for so many years. But these Moriscos, many of them still had sympathies with Islam. They, they had converted only because they had to. And uh, there was a general fear that if the, the fleet of Pascha could was successful enough, they could energized the Moriscos, who lived in Spain itself, to, to start a general uprising, a revolt that could be devastating to Spain. So, so basically, Charles V was really fighting a, a war of, of survival against the Ottoman Empire. Uh, now, to make it even worse for him, um, Francis, his old enemy, the King of France, uh, had no problem allying himself with the Muslims because he wanted revenge. Against, remember, he had lost the Battle of Pavia in 1525, and Francis was was a he, he was a, a man of the Renaissance, not a particularly religious man. He figured, hey, the Muslims can help me get back at my enemy. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So be it. And he made an alliance, and so he was facing a war against both the Muslim Empire and France. And uh, but Charles V, 
he, he just, he, you know, he was a, a man of action. Uh, in 1544, he invaded France and marched his army, threatened Paris itself. Marched his armies north from Spain and Francis had to sue for, for peace and that ended the, the crisis for the moment. So it's important to remember Charles V, he was always busy, constantly at war. Now, many historians would say that his, his, all of his preoccupations with this and that uh, made it so that it allowed for the Lutheran church and Lutheranism and Protestantism to really get a foothold in Germany. See, he was so busy fighting the Muslims and doing all these other actions that he really didn't have, he couldn't devote all of his time to increasing the power of the Holy Roman Empire and crushing Protestantism. Uh, like, he had nothing really personal against Martin Luther. In fact, people think that he liked what a lot of the things that Martin Luther had to say, but it was important for him to maintain the unity of the Catholic Church. So he felt that he had to squash the Lutheran movement. Now, many historians believe that many uh, German princes in the Holy Roman Empire, they didn't want to see a strong Holy Roman Empire. They liked the fact that the Holy Roman Empire was a, was a loose confederation. So many historians think that some German, northern German princes might have encouraged the Lutheran faith and became Lutheran as a way of kind of challenging Charles V and asserting the independence of their principality. And plus the fact that you had a lot of support among the general population for the Protestant movement in, in especially northern Germany. Now, um, uh, eventually these German princesses formed an alliance to fight against Charles V and uh, what gave this, uh, this alliance a big boost was the fact that uh, they soon got help from the King of France. Um, in 1547, Henry II came to the throne. Here he is, he's got some nice legs there. <laughs> Uh, Henry II became the new king. He was the son of Francis, and uh, like his father, he, had, he, was, he was Catholic, ostensibly Roman Catholic, but he had no problem aligning with other people if it boosted his own self-interest. So Henry II made an alliance with the, with the Lutherans of Germany, and uh, eventually Charles V was not in a position to defeat this alliance. So at the Peace of Passau in 1552, at this peace treaty, Basically, um, the war ended, and basically his vision of creating a stronger Holy Roman Empire and uh, establishing the unity of the church, that those hopes were dashed by the Peace of Passau. Now, soon afterwards, there was a big imperial diet, a big meeting of all the representatives of all the German states in the Holy Roman Empire, and so <coughs> they, they, they signed the Peace of Augsburg. And uh, at this Peace of Augsburg, it was decided that the formula was in Latin, all diplomatic documents were in Latin back then, cuius regio, cuius religio, which translated means whatever the religion of the monarch is the religion of the people, of the state. So, um, so the way it worked would be under this piece of Augsburg was that every German state could decide for themselves whether they wanted to be Lutheran or Roman Catholic. And if the, if the ruler was Lutheran, the, the state church was Lutheran. If the ruler was Catholic, <clears throat> the state religion was Roman Catholic. And this, this peace of Augsburg kept peace in Germany for over 50 years. So it, it kept the religious peace in Germany. But it was a huge disappointment for Charles V. And he, shortly thereafter, he actually abdicated the throne in 1555. And uh, he went to live in a monastery, uh, became a monk. Well, not really, he never took holy orders, but he lived in a monastery, died shortly thereafter. And uh, what he decided to do was to divide up his realm. He realized there was just too much for one man to control such an empire. So uh, to his son, to his eldest son, Philip, he gave the kingdom of Spain. Um, he also, Philip II, was given the Duchy of Flanders, the, the Netherlands. He also was given uh, the kingdom of Naples and Sicily, in southern Italy, and control in Italy. And eventually, Philip II, uh, through his marriage, through his mother, would inherit the kingdom of Portugal in 1578. So Philip II got a big chunk of territory. It was, it was decided that, uh, that uh, Charles V's younger brother, Ferdinand, would succeed him as Holy Roman Emperor, as well as the Duke of Austria and the King of Hungary and Bohemia. So from this point onward, you had 
the Austrian Habsburgs in Austria, uh, beginning with Ferdinand I, who were also the Holy Roman Emperors, and then you had the Spanish Habsburgs ruling as the, mainly the kings of Spain. But they always worked in concert one, with one another. So they always, even though they were different kingdoms, they tended to be allies uh, when it came to diplomatic matters. They were, they were like a team, Team Habsburg. Now, um, so let's talk about Philip II. Here, you can see a picture of him. So I, I think those 16th century uh, Europeans really like to show off their legs or something. It must have been the men showed off their legs. He's got the same outfit on. There he is. There he is, the uh, handsome guy there. Um, now, Philip II, he was very different from his father. He, uh, he didn't like to travel a lot. And he decided that he was going to spend <clears throat> the bulk of his time in Spain. He was a Spaniard through and through. And, and uh, in fact, uh, he'd grown up and Spanish was his first language. And uh, <coughs> most of his friends were fellow Castilians from Castile in uh, central Spain. Now, um, Philip II, what he tried to do was to create a system where, um, a more centralized system, where all of his vast realms would be ruled under his direct control, with uh, instead of having local governments having any kind of autonomy or independence like his father, he wanted his officials, his Spanish officials, to govern Italy, to govern the Netherlands. Uh, he wanted to set up a more centralized bureaucracy. Um, the other thing about Philip II was that he felt that he had to answer to no one but God. Uh, he, he, in many ways, he was a forerunner of the absolutism of the 17th century in the sense that he believed that, that uh, no earthly authority could challenge him, that uh, whatever he did was law. His word was the law of the land. And uh, now one of the way, what reasons why he was able to create such a, a strong monarchy was because of the weakening of the Cortes. Now what is the Cortes? Uh, the Cortes is an uh, institution, it's very similar to what we see when we look at the Parliament or the Estates General in the Netherlands. It was a, a system of representative government that went back to the Middle Ages. In the Cortes, you had representation based on social class or position. So in the Cortes, you had uh, representatives from the church, from the bishops and the priests. You had representatives from the aristocracy, the, the knights, the landowning aristocracy, the, the, the aristocrats. And then you had representation from the townspeople, the, the, the commoners. And, and, this is, and every, every province of Spain, Aragon, Castile, had its own elected Cortes. And going back to the Middle Ages, the king could only impose taxes with the consent of the Cortes. So the, it was a medieval institution that, that put limits on the power of the king. Now, Philip II, because of this, all this gold and silver from the New World, he did not need taxes from the Cortes. He didn't need their approval for anything. He had his own source of revenue from the vast wealth of the New World, the gold and silver. So basically, he could ignore the Cortes, and there was no limits on his authority. But also, another thing he could do was that he won over the aristocracy by giving them jobs in his government. He used the wealth of the New World to create a, a huge bureaucracy, and then used that bureaucracy to, um, to, to win over the aristocracy. So they, they were given positions and wealth and power through the king. So in Spain, there developed a tradition that instead of having power through the Cortes, you had power through, through appointment by the king. All power came through the king's patronage, or the king's authority to give jobs uh, to aristocrats. And uh, so that's how the king was able to amass, uh, Philip II was able to amass more and more power over the course of his reign. Now, one of the things he did was that he created the idea of having a centralized capital city. He decided that he didn't want to travel anymore, so he decided to make Madrid a little sleepy little village in the middle of Castile to make that his capital city. And that's where he established his bureaucracy. And just to give you an idea of the wealth of Spain, uh, Madrid, by the end of, Madrid had been a sleepy little village. But by the time of Philip II's death in 1598, it had a population of 100,000 people. It went from nothing to 100,000. Why? Because that's where all the money was. 
That's where the, the bureaucrats went. That's where the aristocracy built their homes. That's where the government was located. And where there's money, you attract people. So that's why, it, but you know, relatively quickly, it went from being a, one of the biggest cities, went from being a village to being one of the biggest cities in Spain, one of the biggest cities in Europe. Um, now, um, Philip II built a massive castle, a massive palace for himself, just outside of Madrid. It's called the Escorial. And uh, now this Escorial is uh, at the heart of soul of kind of understanding and some, they, who Philip II was and some of the controversy surrounding it. You see, the Escorial was uh, built in the shape of a big gridiron. You know, it's something you use to roast a pig. You ever seen a pig get roasted? Now, why was it built in the shape of a gridiron? Because Philip II's favorite saint was St. Lawrence. Now, who was St. Lawrence? St. Lawrence was a man who, and who when he was back in the Roman period, he was being persecuted, and his, his persecutors burned him alive. They put him on a stake, and they burned him. They roasted him. And they, while they were roasting him, they kept saying, renounce Christ, renounce Christ. And, uh, and his, his response was, turn me over. I'm, not, I'm already done on this side. You know, he was this, you know, and then he burned, he burned to death. He was burned alive. He was roasted alive by his captors. And that really inspired Philip II. So he, he built this castle, castle in the shape of a gridiron. And the castle was all black. And it was all decorated with the scenes of the martyrs. You know, people, scenes of martyrs being crucified, beaten, tortured, burned. He loved apocalyptic writing. So it was all these paintings of these bizarre paintings of, of scenes from the apocalypse of St. John. And uh, now, now you're, there are two ways of looking at this. The Spaniards loved this guy. The, the, he was loved by his people. And he was seen as a man devoted to God, a man devoted to his work. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter was that he'd spent hours of his days poring over reports, poring over the bureaucracy. He was a man, a very driven man, working day in and day out, putting long days. So he was very dedicated. And he was loved by, by the people of Spain. And Spain, being devoted to the church and being devoted to the king, became equated with being loving to being, being a Spaniard, being proud of who you were as a Spaniard. So you can see this nationalism building up. Now, Philip II's critics, though, said, they said, oh, all this blackness, all these scenes of martyrs, the real reason Philip II likes this stuff is he is the spot of Satan. I mean, people really thought this guy was, you see, a lot of Protestants thought that this guy was a, was a Satanist. But the reason he dressed in black was because he liked blackness. The reason why he had pictures of the apocalypse was he was visioning, he is the Antichrist taking over the world. And, and he was this monster and uh, evil and despicable, bloody, evil person. So, I mean, either he was this beloved Christian doing his work, loving his people. That's how the Spanish viewed him. But the enemies of the Spanish, like the English, they viewed him as this evil, monstrous, satanic person. So he's a very controversial person. He was, during his own lifetime, he was controversial. Now, one reason why he had lots of enemies was that he devoted his life to waging war. All that gold and silver from the New World, most of it was spent waging war. Because he had lots of enemies. Because he, like, like, his, uh, like his father, he wanted to fight, he wanted to protect the church. So he fought against the Turks. Uh, like his father, he wanted to glorify the, the king's, the Habsburg family. So he had to fight against the Valois of France, the, the age-old enemy of the Habsburg family. Um, plus, he had to deal with Protestants. He wanted to crush the Protestant faith. He thought the Protestants, but in his view, the Protestants were the evil. <coughs> in his view, the Protestants were working with Satan. In his view, the Protestants represented the rise of the Antichrist. So he had the exact view, you know, the, the Protestants viewed him as satanic. He viewed the Protestants as satanic. He felt that he was engaged in this, this good versus evil battle to crush the Protestant faith, which he thought was the spawn of Satan. So he was always fighting he had to fight against the Protestants in the Netherlands. He fought against England, which was the, had become the predominant Protestant kingdom in Europe. Um, and in all these endeavors, he had mixed success. Now his... Uh, he did have success in some areas fighting the Turks, but in most of these areas he faced defeat. He faced, uh, uh, he was not successful at all. Um, just a couple of examples. Well, I, I was real briefly, I want to talk a little bit about these wars uh, because they cover a lot of the history of Europe. Um, now, against the Muslim Turks, that's where he had the greatest success. He actually, 
uh, was able to end the threat that the Muslims, the Turks, were to Spain. Uh, there was, he, formed a, he was able to form a holy alliance. He was able to create an alliance that included Spain and some of the Italian city-states like Venice and, and, and Genoa and the papacy, and he created a huge fleet, and he actually def won a, a spectacular victory over the, uh, over the Muslim fleet at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571. It was fought off the coast of Greece, and uh, the Muslim fleet was decisively defeated. And what this victory did was to uh, protect Spain from future attacks by Muslim pirates. So it kind of freed up the Mediterranean from, from further attacks. Interesting story here is that the commander of the Lepanto, the Spanish commander who led the Allied forces against the Turks, was none other than Don Juan, the Don Juan. It's kind of funny that uh, Don Juan, he was actually filled with this, you know, you've heard of Don Juan, you know, a little lover boy, you call him Don Juan. He was a lover boy. In fact, he, uh, he drank from a cup that was made from the skull of a virgin who had committed suicide uh, because he had broken her heart. Kind of sick that he hold that as a treasure. But he, you know, he was kind of a sick guy. You know? he, but he was the, actually the, uh, the illegitimate son of Charles V. He was Philip II's half-brother. And uh, Philip II embraced him as a brother, even though they were from different mothers, and uh, was uh, his right-hand man. But he was, he was quite, the, quite the ladies' man, and all these legends have risen up about his... Uh, his uh, but it's kind of interesting that a guy with that kind of reputation would be commanding the, the, the Holy Alliance and the war against the jihadist Muslims, but so be it. <clears throat> All right, now, uh, another area, another area where, where Philip II was involved in is, is, is the events in France at this time. Um, uh, in the 16th century, France uh, got bogged down in what's called the Wars of Religion, a, a battle between Roman Catholics and French Calvinists or Huguenots. That, that lasted much of the, 16th, of the later second half of the 16th century. What had happened was that uh, Henry II, who had been a thorn in the side of Charles V, Henry II died, and uh, he had a bunch of young sons. And uh, so his wife, uh, Catherine de Medici, um, well, his widow, she was left with the task of governing France at this time. And she wasn't French. She was Italian. She was actually the niece of a pope, Clement VII. Uh, she was from the House of Medici, the, the Dukes of, of, of Tuscany in Italy. But, uh, but the problem that she faced was that as uh, her, her eldest son, Francis II, died when he was only like 20. Um, and so her second son, Charles IX, he was just a boy. He was like nine years old. So she had to be the regent during this time. And, and this created problems because um, in France, many of the great nobles uh, did not want to take orders from a woman. And many of the great nobles, the nobles of France, you know, they had uh, their own castles, their own private armies. They, they were accustomed to kind of running their, their local area as their own personal kingdoms. And uh, they did not want a real strong central government trying to impose its will on them. So they saw the reign of, uh, Catherine de' Medici as an opportunity to advance their own personal interests at the at the um, to the detriment of the central government. So, but uh, the big problem in France at this time was that many southern Frenchmen, many southern French noblemen, had embraced the Huguenot faith, while Catherine de' Medici, a devout Roman Catholic, was still Roman Catholic. So you had a situation where you had a, an official religion being Roman Catholic, but many in the south of France being Huguenot. Now, um, so you had this, what was going on, it wasn't long before the Huguenots and Roman Catholics were going to battle with one another. Um, actually, it's kind of interesting in American history, uh, the Huguenots from the south of France um, often uh, were, uh, were merchants and pirates, and uh, some, some Huguenots from France established uh, bases in America. In, in, you know of Paris Island uh, in, in South Carolina? There, uh, there and also in, uh, uh, in Florida, they actually established pirate bases because they liked to attack the Spanish ships because the Spanish were Roman Catholic. And in fact, uh, in 1565, the Spanish established St. Augustine in Florida, one of the first European settlements 
in, in North America, in, in what is today the United States. They established it because they wanted a base to wage war on the French pirates who were attacking their ships. But anyway, but uh, so there was, a, there was some, a lot of heat and a lot of uh, fighting going on in France between Huguenots and Roman Catholics. Now, um, in 1572, uh, it so happened that uh, one of these prominent Huguenot nobles, his name was Coligny, he was, uh, he was getting more and more power and influence, and he was actually winning the ear of young King Charles IX. You see, uh, Charles IX listened to Coligny and respected him, and uh, Catherine de' Medici was really afraid that given Coligny's influence with the king, that maybe the king might go Protestant. She also was afraid that maybe her influence would be lost and Coligny, Huguenot French nobleman, would become the dominant force in France. So, Mer Catherine de Medici did something very devious. She, working together with prominent Roman Catholics, they planned to murder as many Protestants as they could, find them catch him off guard and kill him. And she really wanted Coligny dead. So she planned his assassination. So on St. Bartholomew's Day in 1572, the Roman Catholics in Paris and the surrounding towns, and they, they targeted Protestants. Now, Coligny was assassinated, but so were thousands and thousands of Protestants who were completely caught off guard. It's called the St. Bartholomew Massacre. And uh, according to some accounts, as many as 30,000 Protestants were murdered on a single day. It was just a, it was just a bloodshed. Now, the, the legend of Philip II says that the only time that Philip II laughed out loud in his entire life was when he heard that 30,000 Protestants had been killed. That's the, you know, that's the legend of Philip II. So he's very happy to hear this. Well, the story is that Charles IX, when he, when he after this massacre and the death of Coligny, he was so filled with guilt written, so full of guilt, that he got sick and he died just two years later in 1574. But, but what had happened was the St. Bartholomew Massacre had, had triggered a, a, just a full-on war between Huguenots and Roman Catholics in France. Now, well, another thing that happened was that uh, in 1574, the new king of France was Charles IX's younger brother, Henry III. Here he is right here. Now, Henry III was, let's just say, he was a homosexual. Everybody knew it. He liked to wear women's clothing. He liked to act like a woman. So everybody knew that he wasn't going to, I guess he did. Not a homosexual, he did, uh, what do you call this? Uh, trans, transgender guy. He's wearing male clothes there, but he, that wasn't, he didn't like them. He only did that in public. Privately, he always wore women's clothes. So everybody knew that, and nobody knew that he wasn't going to have any children. <laughs> so, well, the problem for that was that the next heir to the throne was a man by the name of Henry of Navarre. And he was, he, now the, he was the king of Navarre. Navarre was a little kingdom, what is today in the Pyrenees, in the, in the mountain that separates Spain from France. And the thing about Henry of Navarre was he was Protestant. He was a Huguenot. And so this created a problem because many Roman Catholics were just completely opposed to the idea that their next king would be a Protestant. Now, it turned out there was another person around named Henry of Guise. A lot of Henry. They called, it, they called this time period the, the days of the three Henrys. Now, Henry of Guise was a prominent Catholic leader who had links to the royal family, and he felt that he should be the next king of France to replace the gay Henry III. So, and he had formed a holy league with the help of Spain to wage war on the Protestants. Now, Philip II was thinking, hey, if I get this guy, Henry of Guise, the next king of, of France, he'll owe me. And that will like, increase the power and influence of the Habsburg family. So Philip II was giving a lot of money to support Henry of Guise in his efforts to become the next king of France. Well, it so happened in 1588 that Henry III, the, the reigning king, he was getting a little tired of everybody talking about how great Henry of Guise was. He was thinking, hey, I'm still king of France. I'm not dead yet. So this is what he did. He invited Henry of Guise to, his, to one of his palaces and said, look, I want you to come to my, my palace. <clears throat> Didn't tell him why he wanted to come. He said, hey, just come to my palace. So Henry of Guise was thinking, oh, this is it. The king is going to recognize me as his heir. 
So he went in there all thinking that he was going to be the next king of France, and he walked into the palace, left his guard, left his arms, just walked into the palace. What does Henry III do? Pulls out a knife and stabs him. Kills him. Knocks him. Kills him dead. Kills Henry of Guise. Well, anyway, Henry III, did, when he did that, you see, so many Roman Catholics were incensed that his life was in danger. So he didn't know anywhere to go. So he went to seek refuge with his cousin, Henry of Navarre, the, the Protestant king of Navarre. Well, the Catholics wanted revenge, and they got it. In 1589, Henry III was out taking a walk, and a monk pulled out a knife and stabbed him and struck him dead. So Henry III was dead. Now that meant that by virtue of family connections and, and, and being the closest relative, male relative, that meant that Henry Navarre in 1589 became the new king of France. He was of the House of Bourbon. So he was the new king of France, but the problem was that not the Catholics weren't willing to accept him as their king because he was Protestant. And Philip II didn't want this man to become king. He was giving money to the Catholics, the Holy Alliance, the Holy League, uh, to wage war against Henry of Navarre, the now Henry IV. Now, eventually what Henry IV did was very smart. He, he really wasn't that religious of a man and wasn't that tied to the Protestant church. So in 1594, he said, look, I've converted to Roman Catholicism. And uh, when he converted to Roman Catholicism, the French Catholics laid down their arms, and they agreed to end the war. And so he was universally accepted as king of France by converting to the Roman Catholic faith and, and leaving his Protestant faith of his youth. And when people asked him about it, he would always say, well, Paris is worth a mass. You know, becoming the king and reigning from Paris, becoming the king of France, is worth taking a mass and being a Roman Catholic. So that was his famous saying, Paris is worth a mass. So if you can use that in an expression, and somebody talks about Paris, hey, Paris is worth a man. Anyway, now, but he didn't forget his former Protestant allies. And in 1598, he issued the Edict of Nantes, which he declared by royal decree that Huguenots could practice their faith without problem. So it was, they, they, were, they were even allowed to have self-government and to have their own uh, defenses, have their own fortifications to protect themselves from Catholic attacks. So the Edict of Nantes established religious freedom for the Huguenots. So, and that ended the wars of religion that had been going on for so long. But it had to be a real galling, really galling to Philip II to have these events play out in France, to see in 1598, when Philip II was on his deathbed, to know that Huguenots in France were able to practice their religion. That probably really bothered Philip II. All right, well, um, let's, take a, uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, for a couple minutes, we've been going on quite a long time, and then we'll be back after three or four minutes. Come back here, and we'll, we'll finish up. All right, now uh, another area where uh, uh, Philip II had to deal with it was uh, another problem area was the Netherlands. Remember, he inherited from his father uh, being the Duke of Flanders, and uh, now Flanders or the Netherlands, as they're called. A uh, couple things, a little background about this area. Um, in, the, in the Netherlands, um, you had the Dutch, also known as the Flemish. Dutch and Flemish are the same people. They speak a Germanic language, very similar to English. Uh, and then Walloons speak French. It's a dialect of French. So uh, in the Netherlands, you had a French-speaking population, and then you had a German-speaking population. Also in the Netherlands, you had a tradition of self-government that went back to the Middle Ages. Um, every province in the Netherlands had its estates. And the estates uh, were very like, much like the Cortes. You had uh, representatives of the church, representatives of the landowning aristocracy, and then representatives of the commoners, townspeople and landowning peasants. And, uh, they, and then all the provinces would send delegates to what was called the Estates General that convened in different cities periodically. And uh, you also had a chief executive uh, in this system. The, uh, the Estates General uh, would appoint, <coughs> or the king would appoint, a stockholder who was the, uh, kind of like the commander of the military forces. 
and uh, there could be more than one stockholder. <coughs> now, <coughs> Charles V, <coughs> when as long as he was king, he was from you know grown up in the he'd grown up speaking Walloon. He grew up speaking French as his first tongue, and uh, he respected the Netherlands and allowed the Netherlands a large degree of self-government. When when Philip II took over, though, he wanted more direct control, so he started appointing Spaniards to govern the region. Now that wasn't too popular. A lot of these, the, the Dutch and the Flemish and the, and the Walloons, they did not like these outsiders, these Spaniards coming in and telling them what to do. He also ignored, you know, he ignored the Cortes, so he ignored the States General, right? He didn't have any respect for it. So he appointed his own officials, and these Spanish officials ruled by decree. And this made Spanish rule very, very unpopular in the Netherlands. Another, another added problem was that many people in the Netherlands were converting to the Protestant faith. Uh, the the, the uh, Reformed Church, the Calvinist Church, made strong headings in the Netherlands, uh, especially among the Flemish and the Dutch, not so much among the Walloons. So Walloons tended to remain loyal to the Roman Catholic. The Walloons lived in the southern parts of the provinces, the southern provinces. They remained loyal to the Roman Catholic faith, while in the northern part provinces, where you had Dutch and Flemish, they tended to, in larger numbers, to convert to the Protestant faith, to become Calvinists. Now, Philip II would not permit any Calvinists or any Protestants whatsoever, so he would burn them at the stake at the time. He would have them arrested. He used the Spanish Inquisition to ferret out suspected Protestants and bring them up on charges of heresy and have them burned at the stake. He burned a lot of Protestants at the stake. Now, this didn't sit too well with many folks in the Netherlands. <clears throat> now, now, one of the most outspoken critics of Spanish rule was a man by the name of William of Orange. We mentioned him earlier. He was one of the earliest believers in freedom of conscience. And he, was, he had converted to the Protestant faith, but he didn't make a big deal William the Silent because he kept his religious beliefs to himself. But he was outraged by the situation. He'd actually been a loyal servant to Charles V when he was a young man. And now he saw the son acting in a way that he thought was despotic and tyrannical. And so, what happened by 1568, there, the, uh, many uh, Dutch sailors uh, began to rebel against Spanish rule and began to actively attack Spanish ships. And they were called the Sea Beggars. That was their name. They were, they were Dutch commoners who were rising up against Spanish rule. <coughs> And uh, William the Orange, even though he was an aristocrat, he came out in support of rebellion, of fighting for the liberties of the, of the Dutch against Spanish tyranny. And he was, and sometimes he's called the George Washington of the Netherlands because he became the leader, the recognized leader of the opposition to Spanish rule, to Spanish government, and a, and a spokesperson for the Protestants who wanted freedom, freedom of religion. Now, um, this... This war, this incident in 1568, started a war that would last off and on for the next 80 years. It wouldn't be till 1648 where the Spanish would formally recognize the independence of the Netherlands. So it took, a, it took 80 years for the, the Dutch to, to be recognized, by the Spanish at least, as an independent country. Now what happened though, during the course of, these, of this war, was that, see some of these Protestants were really as fanatical as Catholics. And uh, some of the Protestants believed that, that any type of church uh, stained glass windows or church statuary was idolatry. That, you know, that many of them were Calvinists or inspired by Zwingli. They believed that churches ought to just be plain buildings. They, you know, maybe some house. They didn't like pomp. They didn't like pageantry. They didn't like ritual. and. Uh, <coughs> These, uh, some of these Protestants would go into churches and smash the artwork. Another thing, that since they didn't believe, you see, the, 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 uh, the Roman Catholics believed that the wafer in the, in the mass, in the communion mass, was the, the body of Jesus Christ. And there was this, when the priest did the ritual, uh, he would say, this is the body of Christ. And they believed that it was Jesus' body, the Eucharist, the, 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 the host, was present, it was the holy host. Well, the Protestants didn't believe that. Remember, the Zwinglians believed it was, that there, it, was just a, it was just a way of remembering Christ's death. There was nothing sacred about the, the wafer. So what Protestants would do, they'd wake, 
they wait outside a church when they're having mass. Then they walk in, they grab the host, they throw it on the ground, and they stamp on it. This is a bunch of crap. Ah! And they do that all the time. They, and they, so they smash all the, all the artwork, and they throw wafers on the ground and step on them. And the, and the Catholics started to tell stories. They say, one time the Protestant smashed on a wafer, and the blood of Jesus, blood came out of it. And everybody's like, ooh. You know, they, they, I mean, it was, it, so it was, it was getting pretty serious. The Catholics and the Protestants were getting pretty serious. So what happened in 1578 was that the southern part of the provinces, where Walloon was primarily spoken, the southern part of the provinces, they declared themselves loyal to the king of Spain. And it became, and it's called the Union of Arras. And they wanted to divide, they wanted to separate themselves from the northern provinces that had become predominantly Protestant. So the Roman Catholic part of the Netherlands uh, re re became known as the Spanish Netherlands. And this would later become the independent nation of Belgium back in, in the 19th century. Now, the northern part of the provinces, where, um, had, which were predominantly Protestant, they reacted by declaring their independence. In 1578, in the Union of Utrecht, the northern provinces declared themselves to be the independent United Provinces, independent of Spanish rule. And uh, instead of recognizing the king of Spain, they elected a stockholder to command their armies, to be their chief executive. And who did they choose? William of Orange. He became the first. And it became the tradition from that point onward that a member of the House of Orange should be elected stockholder of the United Provinces. So um, now this created a situation where Philip II now had to deal with trying to crush a rebellion and an independence movement in the Northern Netherlands. And it, it created a lot of problems for him. And he, by his death in 1598, he had not succeeded. The United Provinces were still free and growing. Now what happened, though, is that traditionally in the Netherlands, the Northern Provinces had been left more sparsely populated and had uh, been more rural. Uh, but what happened with, when, when, the, uh, when this happened is that many Protestants from the South moved north. And so there was a big migration of Protestants from the Spanish Netherlands into the north. And that really did a lot to promote the growth of cities and, and trade. And the northern provinces became really more uh, urbanized and more economically uh, powerful because of this migration of Protestants from the south to the north. Now, another area of concern for Philip II, and his biggest enemy was England and under the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Now, this is kind of interesting, though, because actually England and Spain had one time been allies. At the beginning of the 16th century, Spain and, and England were allies. By the end of the 16th century, they were enemies, hostile enemies. And a lot of it has to do with religion. Now, what does this go back? And it wasn't all religion. Let's go back a little bit here. Now, Henry VIII was married to Captain of Aragon. She was actually the daughter of Ferdinand. So she would have been the aunt of Charles V. And they had been married as a diplomatic process because uh, Henry VII, the father of Henry VIII, wanted to secure, he was new to the crown and wanted to secure the alliance of a powerful country. So he had made this alliance with the House of Aragon to cement his authority and to increase his power within England. Now, um, the, the problem for Henry VIII was that Catherine of Aragon had no sons. And uh, there, was a, there was a strong tradition that, that you had to have a son succeed you. Now, the reason why Henry VIII was so obsessed with having a son succeed him is because of the background of England. You see, uh, before Henry VIII had come to the throne, England had been, been dis almost destroyed by a war called the War of the Roses. Uh, for, uh, it was a, uh, a war between different factions uh, claiming to be the root, true king of England. And uh, Henry VII had won this war by this war, had ended this war. And Henry VIII was afraid that if, if he had a daughter succeed him, then there might be a renewed war and more violence. So he felt the only way to secure his dynasty, the Tudor dynasty, was to have a son. But Catherine of Aragon was... Uh, 10 years older than he was. So when she was about hitting 40, he knew that she wasn't going to have any more kids. And she, all she had did, given him was a daughter, Mary, uh, future Queen Mary. 
So, uh, so he wanted to get rid of her and marry somebody else. He wanted to marry a new woman who could give him sons. So uh, what he wanted to do was marry his mistress, Anne Boleyn. But the problem was is that the Roman Catholic Church did not allow divorce. He could not, I mean, he could not. Now, he wanted to get the Pope. He, he was able to get the church to decide. He was able to get the Church of England, who were under his thumb, to say, well, the marriage between him and Catherine of Aragon uh, should never have happened because uh, she had formerly been married to his older brother, and therefore it was a sin, and they should have never been married in the first place. And therefore the Church of England was all like, hey, King, you can divorce Catherine and marry Anne, no problem. But, you see, all decisions by the Church in England had to be okayed by the Pope. The Pope at the time, when this was all going down, was a prisoner of Charles V, who happened to be Catherine of Aragon's nephew. Now, Charles V is telling the Pope, look, uh, you're my prisoner, and uh, you're not going to grant that divorce, because that's my aunt you're talking about. So the Pope said, uh, sorry, Henry, you have to remain married to Catherine. You married her. You've got to stay with her. We don't allow divorce. That's the end of it. So, Henry VIII, what does Henry VIII do? He wants to make sure that he can have a son. So he says, I declare the Church of England separate from the Pope. We're independent. We're independent of the papacy. We came out of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. We no longer are affiliated with the papacy. And the, in Parliament, this was a move that was very popular among the English. Just like it was among the Germans, the English didn't like these a bunch of Italian popes telling their church what to do. So the Parliament, which is kind of like the Cortes or the Estates General, the Parliament passed the Act of Supremacy in 1534 that made the King of England the head of the church. So the monarch of England was not only the head of state, but the head of the church. Now, um, Henry VIII really wasn't that into the Protestant movement at all. In fact, he had written a, 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 an attack on Martin Luther. His, mo his motives for liberating England from papal rule was purely political, so he could marry Anne Boleyn. Now, ironically, he married Anne Boleyn, and she gave him a daughter and no sons. And he ended up going through six wives. He finally got his, uh, his, his Jane Seymour, his third wife, finally gave him a son. But anyway, now... So finally, he did get his son, Edward VI. Uh, you can see his dates there, 1547-1553. Now, Edward VI came to the throne when he was just a boy. Now, by this time, uh, the Protestant movement was really beginning to jail in England. And the, the head of the church, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was a man by the name of Thomas Cramner. Here's his picture here. Now, Thomas Cramner, he was influenced by Martin Luther, and, and uh, so, and by Zwingli. So he decided <coughs> to reform the Church of England. Uh, with this, he issued, along with the king, who was just basically a kid at the time, the Articles of Religion in 1549. And basically what Cranmer did was to basically make the Church of England into a Protestant church, basically following the lines of Martin Luther. So uh, one way to think of the Church of England is to think of it in many ways, at least at its inception, as a Lutheran church, but in England. The Anglican Church followed many of the ideas of Martin Luther as its reform was put through by Thomas Cranmer. Now, the thing about Edward VI was he was just a kid, and he was only 16 or so when he died in 1553. Obviously, he never married or had children. He was just a kid. So the throne, upon his death, went to his older sister, being the eldest daughter of Henry VIII, Queen Mary known to history as Bloody Mary. Why was she known as Bloody Mary? Well, as soon as she became queen, she had been raised a devout Roman Catholic. So as soon as she became queen, she once again made England a Roman Catholic country by decree. And uh, in fact, uh, she, uh, she even married Philip II. She married Philip II, the king of Spain. He was his, they were, she was 10 years older than he was, but they were married. They were, they were, they were second cousins. And she started a program of of finding Protestants, leading Protestants, and having them burned at the stake. In fact, Thomas Cranmer, the guy who had drafted the, art, the Articles of Religion, the Protestant reformer, he was burned at the stake. Burned at the stake by order of, quote unquote, bloody Mary. Now, the thing about Mary was that when she ascended the throne, she was already pushing 40 in her 40s, and her marriage to Philip II did not produce any children. So when she died in 1558, 
the throne went to her younger sister, Queen Elizabeth, who was in fact the, uh, the daughter of Anne Boleyn. Now, so she assumed the throne in 1558. Now, when she, she assumed the throne, she was Protestant. And so she went to Parliament, and, she, and Parliament passed the Act of Uniformity in 1559, which once again made the Church of England a Protestant church, with her at the head, as the head of the church. Now, a lot of the things that she did... I mean, Queen Elizabeth gets a lot of good press because she's a very powerful woman ruler, and you don't see a lot of powerful woman rulers in history, so she's celebrated to that end. But she wasn't perfect by any, any sense stretch. There were a lot of, she had a lot of enemies. There were, there were Puritans and stuff. Uh, there were a lot of Calvinists who wanted to take the reform of the Church of England even, even further, reform the church along the lines of John Calvin's ideas. And Puritans wanted to keep the Church of England and purify it. That's what they were called, Puritans. They wanted to purify the Church of England of its Roman Catholic elements, you know, kind of purge of, of any remnants of Roman Catholicism. Whereas separatists, the future pilgrims, they wanted to uh, completely abolish the Church of England and have independent church congregations. Well, Queen Elizabeth had no problem burning Puritans at the stake She's, because they, the official religion was the Church of England. Anybody who criticized the Church of England could be burned at the stake. So she was as as ruthless as Philip II was. She did the same things to Catholics. If you were a Roman Catholic and you lived in England and you got caught, you could be burned at the stake as a heretic. So she was as ruthless, maybe not quite as ruthless, but as, as ruthless in promoting a state religion as Philip II was. So, now, Philip II saw her as his biggest enemy because England was an, was an independent state. And the thing about Philip II was that he declared her to be an illegitimate ruler. He, he, she, Philip II said that she was a bastard, that the marriage between her father and Anne Boleyn was Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. All right. Thank you. So, so what happened was that she, uh, Queen Elizabeth had a cousin who was Roman Catholic, who was the Queen of Scotland, named Mary, Mary Queen of Scots. And Henry II, maybe not Henry II, Philip II had a plan to have Elizabeth murdered and put her cousin, the Roman Catholic Queen of Scotland, Mary, on the throne of England. And when that backfired in, uh, in 1587, and, and Queen Elizabeth ordered Queen Mary to be executed, um, that's when he decided to launch a massive invasion of England, the, the Spanish Armada, which failed. So anyway, um, we ran out of time. As the computer has told us, we are glasses ending in 10 minutes. So, uh, our, so what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to pick this up on Thursday. We're going to talk about England in the 17th century and talk about France and its emergence as the greatest state in Europe in the 17th century. We're going to do that on, on Thursday.